All right. You know, it's, it's always a blessing for me to, uh, to hear what's normally like a dull roar in the sojourn uh, gathering and, and greeting time, but uh, I mean, it's just, it's just good to be together. And I hate to interrupt the fellowship, but uh, we want to continue our worship through the reading of God's Word. I want to invite you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 2. And as you do, let me just give one quick announcement. Uh, I don't know if you're, like, if you're like me, you feel like 2021 is moving too quick. I mean, it's like almost spring, hallelujah. Uh, we probably have like a second winter coming because it's Georgia. Um, but we're moving towards Easter. And next Sunday, uh, we're going to get uh, the, the Holy Week schedule, the, the Easter plans out to you. But I want to take a moment this morning to talk about another way that we have uh, an opportunity to engage our neighbors to get back outside uh, on the Elm Street Green for those of you who gathered out there with us. The Friday before Palm Sunday, that's the final Friday of March, we are hosting a citywide Seder dinner. Uh, on the green, a lot of Messiah Ministries is partnering with us. Uh, we're going to open it up to our neighbors, to other churches. Uh, we're going to gather. We're going we're to share in the Seder. We're going to retell the story of God's redemption uh, through his people, Israel, out of Egypt, all pointing to Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we want to invite you to be part of that. Uh, gather friends and neighbors. Uh, you have to RSVP. Uh, and there is like social distancing. So you can RSVP uh, for a chair, table. You can bring your own blanket and kind of sit on the outskirts if you want to be a little bit separate from people. But you've got to RSVP so you can do that today uh, on the app or at the desk in the lobby. So Citywide Seder coming up the final Friday of March. Super excited for the opportunity uh, to bless our neighbors with the good news of the gospel. Man. I feel like our seat is ready, right? We're ready. Uh, so let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to invite you to stand in honor of God's word. And we want to posture ourselves to give the word of God our attention as we ask the spirit to posture our hearts uh, to receive the truth this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 9. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray your spirit would open us. Uh, that we would encounter mercy and that mercy would move us to live for you. Uh, God, may you bring change, and not only in our hearts, but our homes, this community, that Christ may be praised. We ask in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're like week five or six on like the same two or three verses. And I find that when we've settled into like one passage or like three words for a long time, we kind of lose the landscape. And so let me just remind you where we've been. Uh, we started 2021 in 1 Peter chapter 1 with the call to hope fully in Christ. Uh, to turn to all, from all the things that we hope in and to hope fully in him. And hoping in him frees us to live for him. Uh, to pursue holiness. To be a people who align our lives with God's purposes. We turn to him, the, the one whom our hope is found and coming to him, we're being built up. Built up to be a spiritual house. That is to say, the people of God, the community of God, is to be a place where God's presence uniquely dwells. Wherever we go, there God is. Through the people of God, his presence invades the world. And we want this to change how we gather. Not just that we gather, but how we gather. We want to expect more of him. Uh, we are being built up to be a priesthood. Priests are privileged to experience life in God's presence. And in God's presence, they grip the plow and participate in God's work. We draw near to others on behalf of God, and we draw near to, to God on behalf of others. This is our calling. And, and as, as participants, we offer what the what it says are spiritual sacrifices, whether they're praise for the glory of God or we offer ourselves in acts of service and love for others. Regardless, we offer Christ perfects. This is the way of Jesus. Now, last, uh, last Sunday, we, we began to land more and more into verse 9, reminding ourselves that, that it's not our work that shapes our, 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 our identity. It's not what we do that shapes who we are, but it's the reverse. Right? God has acted upon us. He has changed who we are, and that shapes how we live. And so let's remind ourselves of this identity. Verse 9 again, 
But you, those who are in Christ, those who are coming to Christ, those who hope in him, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, each identity is connected to a responsibility, a responsibility as priests. So last Sunday, we looked at being chosen and treasured. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that God chooses a people for the sake of his own name among the nations. God's people exist to declare the praise of God. And this is our first function as priests. Priests declare God's praise. Call the world to see who God is and what he's done. This Sunday, we're going to begin to dive into royal priesthood. And what we're going to see is that priests speak God's promises. We declare God's praise. We speak God's promises. This is rooted in God's people in the Old Testament. So we're going to exit 1 Peter. We're going to kind of make our way around the Old Testament. May God bless our time as we navigate his word. Uh, it, it turns out the, the Exodus 19 call to God's people to be a, a people of priests was a call to declare the praise of God and to speak the promises of God. They had a function in this world, and their function was a speaking role. So to be a priest was not to be silent or sideline or sit in the stands. No, the, the role of the priest was a speaking one. We, we see this throughout the Old Testament. I'm going to pull out two. This is 2 Chronicles 35. It says this, He appointed the priests to their offices and encouraged them in their service in the house of the Lord. And he said to the Levites, who taught all of Israel, the priest had a function of speaking the promises of God over the people of God. Again, Malachi chapter 2 is when God begins to judge uh, the people uh, for ignoring their call as priests. And he says this, for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. And people seek instruction from his mouth. Priests were set apart, called by God to speak the promises of God. And you might say, Trent, why are we using, like, the term promise? Like, why say priests are called to speak the promises of God instead of saying priests are called to speak the word of God? Or priests are called to speak the truth of God? Is it, is it simply because, like, declaring God's praise and speaking his promises both start with P and it's easier to remember? Well, that's part of it, but no. And I understand that as we talk about promise, like, some of us get the uh-oh feeling. We're like, oh, man, Trent's, like, gone full-blown, like, charismatic and... You know, we're going to go there, you know, just prophesy and promise and it's yours. And that's not at all what we mean. Rather, what we want to call each other to is to rediscover the life-giving word of God. You see, you and I have been brought up in a culture that places the word of God on a clean, sterile table and calls us to dissect it. To learn, like, how it fits together and, like, you know, maybe, like, how it's connected and maybe what it means. But it's always separate and devoid of life. And this is not how the ancients interacted with the word. You see, it's the promises of God that make the word of God personal. And when you look at the Old Testament, they can't speak of the word of Yahweh without declaring his promises. It's everywhere. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Before the word of God is spoken, they declare who he is. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What does that mean? Well, read the story. What does it mean for God to be the God of Abraham? It means he's the God of promise. Who draws near to people and calls them to a new way of living. And he gives promises along the way. When, when, when the Psalms declare that God is faithful, this is not like cut off from reality. It's not generic. You know, it's not just like, did I have a good Friday? God's faithful. No, the psalmist is captivated by the faithfulness of God to his promises. Even in Exodus, the law of God starts with a promise and ends with a promise. It is a promise. No, all of history and all of the scripture is pointing to a person who is the fulfillment of the promises of God. This is why the people of God who would stray would be called back to his. This is why they lived the word consumed the word, loved the word, prayed the word, sang the word, because this was what their hope was in. 
you and I don't talk about promises often, and unbeknownst to some of us, you are created to resonate with promise. Your heart aligns with promises. Promises are the current. They order your priorities, and they shape what you do. Where you went to college was based on promises. The career path you're navigating was based on promises. The dating relationships you got involved in were based on promises. You got the courage to pop the question because of promises. You said yes because of promises. You remind your spouse of that often. Your kids play sports because of promises. You save money or spend it because of promises. Promise is the undercurrent of all of life. It's what causes us to come alive and orders our priorities and all of our actions. The scripture was given to a people who sought to satisfy their promises in other gods and the ways of the world. The scripture is the word of promise. You and I have grown up in a culture where the word of God is is no longer personal because we've severed the word from the promises of God. And so I want to call us back to that. The priests in the Old Testament were called to speak the promises of God. This is the ark of Scripture. The promise begins in Genesis. The promise ends in Revelation. The ancients knew no other way than to interact with the word of God through a powerful, personal God of promise. It calls them to come alive. This is why when Paul enters the scene and Paul speaks to the Jews about Jesus Christ, he says it this way, Acts 13. We tell you the good news, that's the gospel, what God promised. We tell you the fulfillment of the promises of God, he, wrote, he raised up Christ Jesus. That's why he says in Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel promised beforehand. Like Paul is screaming to the church, the promises of God make the word personal. Too many of us interact with the word of God standing on the seashore before the ocean. The ocean is the word. And most of us interact with it disconnected. Maybe it splashes up on us at some point, but there's a big gap, a disconnect between God's word and our life. There's a boat on the seashore called promises. Pushed along by the wind. 
person. I want you to think of your roommate, perhaps, that you live with. Or think of your children. I want you to think of your spouse. I want you to think of last week or maybe the week to come. There are moments. Moments of doubt, moments of pain, moments of hurt. There are moments where members of your family will feel far from God. Where your roommate will struggle with doubt. They don't need a preacher. They need a priest. One who in that moment can declare the promises of God in their life. Hebrews 5 reminds us that all of us are meant to be teachers. Whether it's culture that has encouraged us to be silent or it's fear that keeps us from stepping in, what we need to grow up is a community of people who will declare the promises of God over each other. Priests speak the promises so the promise is, think of it again like a boat, like the promise is what allows us to leave the seashore, to, to explore the depths of the ocean. The promise is make the word personal, but his promise also empowers us to speak God's word to the heart of others. Now, if you've been part of uh, Caleb's like weekly missional community gospel training thing, I don't know what he calls it. Uh, maybe you should do it. I'm sure it's a, a huge benefit if you've been part of that. You know that Caleb is obsessed with Tim Chester, who wrote what he called the four G's. Simply ways to speak God's word through God's promises. I want to show you what they are. C consider for a moment Psalm 86. There is none like you among the gods. O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. O Lord, and shall glorify your name for you are great. And do wondrous things. You alone are God. We see the promises of God fulfilled in the person of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He, through his power, spoke all things into existence he, by his word, holds all things together. God is great. You do not have to be in control. That's great. The promises allow the word to sink into our souls and shape how we live. Con consider another one. This is Psalm 24. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Now we live in a world that's not full of peace, but it's different than it was back then where every, every neighbor, every tribe would war against one another on the weekly. And people would be in awe of and would respect and would fear the most powerful army. And the psalmist is saying, listen, there's one who's mighty. It's the Lord. He doesn't fight against us, he fights for us. God is glorious. God is glorious. You do not have to fear others. How much of our life and the life of your children, the life of your roommate, the life of your spouse, he alone. Consider Psalm 30, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Again, we find fulfillment in Christ who embodied mercy and calls us to God. Through him we're invited to draw near, to taste and see. God is good. God is good is good. You do not have to look for satisfaction anywhere else. God is good. God alone. Maybe consider Psalm 86. But you, O Lord, are God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
God is gracious. You do not have to prove yourself. You see, what we need to navigate the complexity, the difficulty, the hardships of this world are people who will make the word of God personal. Who will speak the promises of God to each other, over each other. It's totally fine to like navigate the, the internet and find a good sermon or find a meme on Facebook. Like all that's great. Priest, speak God's promises. Now, maybe you're like struggling already because you're like, I am not qualified. Don't put a lot of weight in your words. Don't do it. I get where you're coming from. I get where you're coming from. Maybe you'd say, Trent, like, you have a degree to teach the Bible. Priests are not professionals. Don't go there. Three things. Three things I want to invite you into this week. Priests who speak the promises of God first consume the word of God. You see, our, our tendency when we hear things like this is to say, Trent, we need a new training program. I need to be thoroughly equipped and trained up to do this. Well, it can be helpful to train you to speak God's word. Caleb's doing a gospel care training this fall. Maybe that will be beneficial for you. But friends, you do not need to be trained in how to talk. I want to remind us of what Joanna called us to early. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you have that friend who like always talks about their job, you know, to the point where you're like, I don't really want to be around this person anymore. No one trained them on how to do that. You know, that one person that you know uh, loves the Atlanta Braves because they can only speak of 96, right? No one trained them how to do that. You and I speak of what we consume. It overflows naturally. You don't need to be trained in how to speak the promises. You need to be changed by the promises. Just take time. Consume the word for yourself. Preach the promises of God for yourself. I think of Colossians chapter 3 says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it dwell in you richly, teaching and counseling, admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing. The word of God is to be sung. The promise of God is to be sung. But we don't go there first, right? It's not how do I talk and how do I sing. It's no, let it dwell in you. Like first, get in the boat. Move out into the deep waters. Let the spirit of God make the word of God personal again. This is your story. Taste and see. Priests who declare God's promises consume the word and they speak the word. Friends, you don't need you need practice. There's a big difference. Most of us have grown up in a church where we are so used to listening to one person talk about Jesus that we've forgotten how to talk about him. That's why when you get in community group, has everyone, you've, you've had this, right? You're all good talking about the game. And then like Jesus is dropped. The room gets silent and everyone gets awkward. Have you had that experience? I have, right? Everyone looks to me, right? Oh, friends. You need to practice speaking the word. Now, the, the priesthood isn't restricted to an hour and a half a Sunday. The priesthood isn't restricted to the worship gathering. But I want you to hear me very clearly. What I've observed in the life of Christians is that the way they show up 
to the gathering is the way they show up at home. Let's bridge the gap. You do not have to continue to say, as a follower of Jesus, that it's been five years since you shared the gospel with someone. You do not have to say, I haven't taught the Bible in a decade. Get in the boat. Get off the shore. Start speaking. You can show up next Sunday to speak the promises of God to a young soul who is hungry for a different story than what the world will offer. No, that is not the fullness of priesthood. But I promise you, if you draw near to children and declare the promises of God, you will start speaking the God to your the promise of God to your own children and to your own spouse and to your own neighbor. I promise you that. I promise here to teenagers who are being called to, to hope in the promise of a world that is decaying and destroying the very lives that we're living. If you show up to speak the promises of God, it will radically shape the way you talk outside of church. You don't need to be trained. You need to be priests. And we have set up a church culture that robs you of the joy of seeing people change. I think of First Peter chapter 2 here, but let me just remind us of this one. Been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. The word of God isn't just personal and powerful. The word of God changes us. It is a seed to be planted. It has the power to bring change. It is not us. When you and I give ourselves to the work of speaking the word of God to others, we make ourselves available to be tools of lasting change. It's time to expect more. Finally, Priests who speak the promises of God, pray the word. Pray the word. I just pulled John chapter 15. Christ speaking to his disciples said, if you abide in me, that is if you trust in me, you wait in me, you rest in me. And if my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Jesus makes a connection between our experience of the presence of God and our consuming, (laughs) consistent dwelling in the word of God to a vibrant, fruitful prayer life. This is why the early church, the first prayers recorded for us in the book of Acts, quoted scripture. It's why Jesus on the cross quoted Psalm 22. When the word gets inside of you, Everything changes. Consume it. Speak it. Pray it. We want to be a people who grip the plow and be, to become tools of lasting change. It is not our words that are weighty. It's his. Offer. Let him perfect. Many of us have been blessed by the ministry of prayer from one individual at Sojourn. If you're a lady at Sojourn, you've received cards in the mail, prayers and scriptures. And I've asked Maritza to come up here and to lead us in prayer. There's going to be a, a moment to not only pray together, but to take a, a moment of silence to move towards the Lord in prayer. We want to do that in faith right now. Hear from the word of the Lord, from Isaiah 65. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Let us pray. Lord, teach us to pray 
Some of us think that we're not skilled in the art of prayer. Remind us that as we draw near to you in thought, our spirits long for your spirit and reach out to you longing to feel you near. Help us, Lord, to express the deepest emotions that lie hidden in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to marvel at the mystery of your love that can regard our lowest state and can be concerned with our weaknesses and our needs when you have so many children all around the earth with so much need, so much sin, and so much sorrow. Yet, in your great love, you have stooped to listen to us. May the wonder of it all enthrall our hearts and the meaning of it captivate our will. Lord, make strong our faith that you are listening to us, even that the petitions rising from our hearts are heard by you and have set in motion through your divine love, your help and assistance. You have invited us, Lord, to ask, to seek, to knock, assuring us that if we ask, it shall be given to us. If we seek, we shall find. If we knock, it shall be opened. Help us to believe that, O oh God. Give us the faith to ask, knowing that we shall receive. Give us the faith to seek, believing that we shall surely find. Give us the faith and the persistence to knock, knowing that it shall be indeed open to us. With this faith, I ask you all to take a moment and pray silently to the Lord right here where you are. Tell now your own needs to him who acts for you by appointment, waiting to speak to you reassuringly, comfortingly, forgivingly. Now let us speak to him and hear him speak to us. We pray, Lord, that you will give unto us only what we really need so that we will have the vision, the courage that shall enlarge our horizons and stretch our faith to seeing and living your loving will for us. Help us to live a life in daring faith and humble trust that there may be worked out in us, even me, your righteousness and goodness. And now we thank you that the fresh breath of heaven is even now blowing away the close, damp air of all our doubts and all our fears. We ask, Lord, that through all our prayers, you refurbish our faith, you brighten our hopes. You revive and rekindle our love for you. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You know, before you stands, um, a failed priest failed father so many of you may be wrestling and you're like man. if you're a parent whether your kids are 8 or 18 or 48 you can't convince people to follow Jesus 